Hi, I am Heta Khoza, a neuropsychologist based in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. I have affiliations with the HIV Mental Health Research Group and the Neuroscience Institute. During this lecture, I will give an introduction to what neuropsychology is, why we do it, and how we go about doing it. The aim is to give anyone who is new to the field insight into what we do, both with regard to research and clinical practice. Neuropsychology has a long and rich history, and modern day neuropsychology is rooted in the study and assessment of traumatic brain injuries sustained by soldiers in the two world wars and subsequent wars because soldiers often received head injuries that affected a very specific part of the brain through a bullet wound or a shrapnel wound, as opposed to diffuse head injury that is, for example, seen in car accidents today. One way of assessing how the brain mediates or produces behaviour and higher cognitive functions is through using the lesion method. Using the lesion method, Patients with brain damage are examined to determine which brain structures are damaged and how this influences their behaviour. Neuropsychologists try to match the specific brain area affected to an observed behaviour by asking the patients to describe their experiences and by doing neurocognitive testing and research observations of the patients. Thus, it's possible to determine whether loss of functionality in a specific brain region causes behavioural changes or an inability to do a specific task. For example, a patient with a lesion in the posterior parts of the left frontal of the left inferior frontal gyrus, also known as Broca's area, will have Broca's aphasia, a severe difficulty producing words. Another important contributor is the 20th century intelligence movement that studied human intelligence using scientific method. This movement was started by a man called Sir Francis Galton, who died in 1911. He also pioneered psychometric and statistical methods. Psychometric testing is the field of study concerned with the theory and methods used to measure individuals' mental capabilities and behavioural styles. Most neuropsychological tests are based on traditional psychometric theory. Alfred Binet further developed and illustrated the utility of using standardized tests and test batteries and test batteries through devising intelligence tests. Tremendous progress has also been made in cognitive psychology and neuroanatomy, and this has contributed to more refined understanding of cognitive functions like language and memory. Just to clarify, cognitive psychology studies the way people process information that is how we absorb, process, and respond to information. Think neural networks. Neuroanatomy is the study of the structure and organization of the nervous system, including the brain. Neuroimaging, like CT scans and MRI scans, have helped enormously here. All this has led to how we practice clinical and research neuropsychology today. Using neurocognitive tests and clinical observations, we test thinking skills, for example, how well your memory works, and the nature of the memory difficulties, or how well you pay attention and solve problems. Neuropsychologists work with a multidisciplinary team of people, neurologists, psychiatrists, occupational health therapists, and language therapists. A neurologist is a medical doctor who specializes in treating diseases of the nervous system. It includes the brain and spinal cord. Neurologists manage and treat neurological conditions. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor who specializes in the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of mental illness. Treatment is mostly managed and achieved through prescription of psychotropic medication. People often confuse psychiatrists and psychologists. Psychologists are not medical doctors and can't prescribe medication and psychologists use therapies such as cognitive behavioural therapy and psychotherapy to treat patients. Occupational therapists are key in rehabilitation. They use assessment and intervention to develop, recover or maintain the meaningful activities of individuals. OTs often work with people with mental health problems, disabilities, injuries or impairments. 
a speech and language therapist specializes in communication and swallowing difficulties. They provide support and rehabilitation for patients who have suffered language-related brain injuries, as is often seen in stroke patients. Neuropsychologists specialize in understanding the relationship between the brain and behavior, in particular, how the relationship can be applied to the, to the diagnosis of brain disorder. This is based on the way that behavior and skills are related to brain structures and systems. For example, the frontal lobes are closely linked with the cognitive domain executive functioning. Other cognitive domains are memory, language, processing speed, attention and concentration, visual spatial functioning and motor functioning. I provided a link to a paper if you are interested in reading more about the cognitive domains, but I will briefly explain what they are during this lecture. At a basic level, we study how our brains produce behavior and how that behavior goes wrong when something happens to the brain. When we talk about behavior, we refer to different things, including cognitive abilities, emotions, movement, and personality, essentially everything that the brain controls. I include personality here because people may often remark that a person is not themselves anymore after a brain injury. I'm not referring to the clinical concept of personality disorders used in clinical psychology and psychiatry. A good example of personality change with regard to neurological injury uh, is the famous case of Phineas Gage. On 13 September 1848, the 25-year-old Phineas Gage was working as a foreman of a crew of men who were building a train track near Cavendish, Vermont in the United States. He was using an iron tamping rod, the one you can see in the picture there, to pack explosive powder into a hole. The powder prematurely detonated, sending the 43 centimeter long and 3 centimeter wide rod through his left cheek, right through his brain and out the top of his head. It landed several meters away from him. Despite this tremendous blow, he survived for 12 years after the accident. Harlow, a doctor who attended to Gage, described him as follows. Previous to his injury, although untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said that he was no longer Gage. Unquote. Harlow's account suggests that the injury led to a change in his behavior and loss of social inhibition, leading Gage to behave in ways that were seen as inappropriate. The traumatic brain injury that he suffered destroyed much of his left frontal lobe, an area of the brain we now know to be important to higher order functions such as language, social cognition, and reasoning, and that may lead to personality change when damaged. To provide you with an overview of what the different cognitive domains are, memory first. It is, a complex, it is complex and has different components that are assessed in different ways. Briefly, working memory or short-term memory is the type of memory that we use when we, for example, keep a phone number in mind to dial. It is assessed by using a test called digit span, where people are asked to repeat a series of numbers back to you. People with poor working memory will perform poorly, will perform poorly on the digit span backwards test. Semantic memory is our memory for facts. People with Alzheimer's disease will present with this type of memory impairment. It is tested by asking people to, for example, name pictures using the Boston naming test or asking people about current issues, for example, who the current president of the country is. Episodic memory is our ability to remember events and experiences. We test this by giving patients a list of words to learn, 
for example, the Hopkins verbal learning test, or telling them a story and asking them to tell the story back to us. This includes learning new material and delayed recall for the information. Procedural memory is our memory for how to do things. For example, riding a bike or playing a musical instrument. Attention and concentration is the next domain and these are often used interchangeably. Attention is the ability to focus on a particular stimulus and to maintain that stimulus in mind, sometimes over an extended period of time. Attention is a very important component of neuropsychological evaluation. Attention facilitates many of the other cognitive functions, for example memory. There are several aspects to attention. One aspect is the ability to remain focused on a task. Another aspect of attention is divided attention. The ability to devote cognitive resources to more than one task at a time and completing each properly. This is particularly important for activities like driving. Another aspect of attention is the ability to initiate or inhibit actions, actively switching between tasks as necessary. We have limited attentional resources. That is why we would do a task poorly when multitasking in comparison to focusing on one task at a time. Digit span forwards is a test of simple attention and the D gives color word test and Stroop tests like the one on the example on the slide here test other attentional constructs. Processing speed is defined as the time it takes a person to do a mental task. It is related to the speed in which a person can understand and react to information they receive, whether it be visual, for example letters and numbers, auditory, for example language, or movement. When patients have to do things faster, it is also more difficult for them to do these things. This is why it is important when doing time tests like the color trails, or the TNT A and B, that's the trail making test A and B, or digit symbol coding, that patients are made aware that they need to work as fast as they can and that the tester times the tests accurately. Speech and language and communication skills include the nature of aphasic, those are language disorders, and dysarthria, impairment of articulation. This is important because it impacts performance on tests and is relevant for considerations of functional impact of cognitive impairments. Visuospatial perception and constructional skills. Brain injury may cause visual field disorders, problems with visual acuity, spatial contrast sensitivity, Visual adaptation, for example, adapting between light and dark, color perception, figure ground separation, or movement perception. As neuropsychologists, we need to be aware of these deficits and how to test for them. Although we are sometimes aided by um, ophthalmologists in this task. Patients may also present with agnosia, which is the loss of the ability to recognize objects, faces, voices, or places. It may be caused by dementia, cancer, or TBI, and some other conditions. Patients may also present with unilateral neglect, an attentional disorder where people may ignore the visual field opposite to a stroke lesion. For example, it had been noted that some patients who have this may only shave half of their face. In Alzheimer's disease, patients with visuospatial difficulties often may get lost. Tests like block design, showed in the right top corner of this slide, is used to test construction skills. And spatial span, showed in the bottom right picture, tests visual attention and working memory. Executive functioning is the ability to plan and problem solve, self monitor and regulate behavior. It is a set of mental skills that include working memory, flexible thinking and self-control. 
We use these skills every day to learn, work, and manage daily life. Trouble with executive function can make it hard to focus, follow directions, and handle emotions, among other things. And it is a very important skill that we continually use. Mood, personality, and behavior. When regions of the brain responsible for emotional processing and emotional control are damaged, it may result in emotional liability, irritability, anger control, or personality changes. People who are disinhibited, more impulsive, and emotionally labile, or those who are unable to initiate activity in the same way as before, are most frequently described as having a changed personality. So, neuropsychologists examine cognitive consequences of brain damage, brain disease, and severe mental illness. Neuropsychological assessment and research is used to study the organization of brain activity and its translation into behavior as well as specific brain disorders and behavioral disabilities. Neuropsychological studies are used to gain knowledge with regard to diagnostic issues, vocational problems, and patient care needs. This informs clinical practice. Neuropsychological assessment is used to collect diagnostic information, including differential diagnostic information, that is the list of possible conditions or diseases that could be caused by the patient's symptoms. Uh, it is also used to identify neurological disorders, helping to distinguish between different neurological conditions, for example, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia and discriminating between psychiatric and neurological symptoms, for example, depression and or anxiety, or a degenerative brain condition. Providing behavioral data is useful for localizing the anatomical site of a lesion, for example, in a stroke and in epilepsy. A precise neurological diagnosis is essential for careful management of many, neuro many neurological disorders. Neuropsychological evaluations that describe how a patient's functioning has been impacted by injury can be used in many different ways when caring for and treating patients. The relative sensitivity and precision, precision of neuropsychological tests make them an important tool for following the course of neurological disease. Regular evaluations repeated over time can provide reliable indications of whether the underlying disease is changing, how rapidly it's changing, and in what manner it is changing. Rehabilitation of cognitive deficits is important for improving patients' lives. Here, an accurate assessment of neuropsychological performance is necessary to establish their baseline cognitive ability. This will inform the design of, an, of, a, rehabilitative, of a rehabilitation program based on the patient's mental capabilities. Repeating assessment during rehabilitation can inform treatment direction and demonstrate a patient's improvement over time. Neuropsychological tests are intrinsically performance-based. They are designed to make individuals exercise their skills in the presence of an examiner so that they can be observed as they do the tests. Self-reports of functioning, as well as observations of behavior while performing testing, are critically important pieces of information. It is also important to keep in mind that self-reports of functioning are often affected by the presence of neuropsychiatric conditions, such as depression and anxiety. And, as most of you know, we usually screen for these conditions or measures when, in re when, when we use them in research settings, so that we can take them into consideration when we analyze the data. People with brain damage may also lack insight into their deficits and underreport their cognitive difficulties. Now, while these are things that we pay close attention to in clinical settings, they're also really important for research observations. For example, I train my research staff to pay close attention to how patients perform tests, how they carry themselves, and if they have any disabilities they may impact, that may impact on their test performance, for example, a sore or a stiff finger. If they notice anything out of the ordinary, they make a note of these clinical observations after the assessment. 
These op observations are often helpful in explaining why a, pa why a patient may be an outlier on a test when it comes to data analysis. Today we understand that, compromise, that a compromised brain, be it through conditions like dementia, epilepsy, stroke, cancer, HIV or physical injury, can affect the way a person feels, thinks and behaves. And therefore the way that that person would function on a daily basis with regard to the way they interact with people and do everyday tasks like managing their finances and work activities. This is because cognitive skills are the core skills your brain uses to think, read, learn, remember, reason and pay attention. These cognitive skills do not work in isolation. For example, if you have poor attention, it may feel like you have a poor it may feel like you have a poor memory. However, attention difficulties are quite different to memory difficulties. And this distinction is important for diagnosing patients with different conditions. For example, if you go to the shopping mall with your friends and you park your car and you're all laughing and chatting and you're not paying attention to where you park your car, when you want to return to your car, you may think that you had forgotten where you had parked your car, but you had actually never paid attention to where you parked your car. So, Using neurocognitive testing, neuropsychologists can pinpoint what cognitive difficulties a patient is presenting with, and this is useful with regard to describing the cognitive presentation associated with different diseases, diagnosis of patients, and rehabilitation. So neuropsychologists can help determine diagnosis, the nature of the neurocognitive impairment that a person has, and how severe these are. There are important questions that we need to ask in research and in clinical practice, keeping in mind that research informs clinical practice to a large degree. Is there evidence of organic brain dysfunction? Sometimes cognitive impairment is the only indicator of a pathological process. What is the nature and extent of cognitive impairment? It is not only necessary to establish cognitive weaknesses, but we also need to establish the cognitive strength of patients. What are the implications for the pattern of cognitive strengths and weaknesses for the rehabilitation program? What are the practical consequences of cognitive impairment? That is, how does it directly impact a person's life with regard to work, leisure and educational activities? How are mood and behavior affected by the brain dysfunction? Does cognitive performance change over time? And how is cognitive function affected by medication? Some medications may affect cognition negatively and that needs to be taken into account. So we now know that neuropsychological testing informs diagnosis and distinguishes patterns of cognitive impairment. When we say patterns of cognitive impairment, what do we mean by that? So here are some examples. In patients who've had a stroke, depending on where in the brain the stroke had happened and, severi and the severity of the stroke, the patient's behavior, thinking, memory, language, and other cognitive functions can be affected in mild or very severe ways. The symptoms that the patient presents with can also help to pinpoint where the brain and the I mean where the where in the brain the stroke occurred. In the dementias, there will be differences between Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body disease, and Parkinson's disease, for example, that impacts treatment options and informs the patient and their family of future outcomes and rehabilitation options. Traumatic brain injury presents with varied presentations depending on the type of traumatic brain injury, for example, whether it is a diffused or a localized injury. If a patient has a diffused injury, their, their cognitive impairments are much more global, where in comparison to a localized injury, it may be related to a very specific um, cognitive impairment. Patients with diffuse injury often have reasoning and problem-solving difficulties. Neuropsychological assessment can also help to determine future outcomes 
which is important when, for example, people with traumatic brain injury claims compensation for their injury, so in medical legal cases. In HIV, neuropsychologists have tracked the way that the virus affects the brain very successfully. For example, we have a comprehensive understanding of how antiretroviral medication has changed the presentation of cognitive impairment in patients over time with development of better treatments. Research has also highlighted that we need to start to provide screening and rehabilitation to HIV-positive patients with cognitive symptoms. With regard to HIV, Dr. Ruben Robbins will give a lecture on the series addressing neurocognitive aspects of HIV in adults, and Dr. Nicole Phillips will present neurocognitive aspects of HIV in children, so look out for their seminars. With regard to schizophrenia, neuropsychological testing is used to determine what assistance a patient may require in daily functioning and to inform rehabilitation needs. Where cognitive impairment is the only indicator of a pathological process, we need to be able to distinguish between psychiatric and organic brain disorder. The most common situation of this sort involves whether a person who complains of a memory problem is suffering from an organic brain disease, such as dementia of the Alzheimer's type, or a mood disorder, such as depression. Importantly, results from neuropsychological tests help the patients and their family to understand what is happening and what to inspect and what to expect in the future. Neuropsychological tests come with strict guidelines on how they must be administered. I am going to highlight a few points here and suggest that you watch Dr. Anthony Santara's lecture on neuropsychological testing fundamentals in this series to learn more about this. Tests should be administered in a quiet room where there are no disruptions. This may be difficult in our low resource settings and we need to think carefully about how we do this. If any disruptions take place during testing, make a note of it. Tests come with standard test instructions and this should be followed carefully. It is important to pay close attention to how the test materials must be placed in front of the patient. For example, when patients are asked to draw, the complex, to draw complex figures like the array complex figure, they sometimes want to turn the stimulus page on its side. When this happens, you can gently turn the page the correct way and ask the patient to leave the stimulus page in that position. It is important to test instructions. It's important that test instructions be given as stated in the stimulus booklet. For example, when you do the color trails test, the instructions say, the instruction is to say, go from this circle to that circle. You should not provide the patient with a mnemonic by saying, go from the yellow circle to the pink circle. You should, however, make sure that the patient understands the test instructions and may paraphrase, paraphrase the instructions where the patient doesn't grasp what is required from them. Timing is very important in some tests and must be done accurately and paid close attention to. When a patient is asked to do something as fast as they can, this increases the cognitive burden and this is an important part of the test. Very importantly, as a test administrator, you can never help the patient with a test, even if they ask for help. This can be difficult sometimes because our natural inclination is to help people. But if you help the person, you are not testing their true ability and your results will be useless. We all sometimes make mistakes. The important thing when you make a mistake when you do neuropsychological testing is to make a note of it and to tell your supervising neuropsychologist and project manager immediately. When we know what mistakes have been made, we can work with it. If we don't know what mistakes have been made, we simply get unreliable data. If you are not sure about something, ask. Never be afraid to clarify any questions that you may have. So in research, we use neuropsychological testing to further our understanding of the brain and behavior and to inform clinical practice. And we do this in several ways. 
Research makes it possible for us to tease apart what basis a person's cognitive performance um, on what basis a person's cognitive performance is impaired. For example, due to depression, an insult to the brain, or perhaps something like substance abuse. It helps us map it helps us map impairment related to disease. For example, there have been clinical reports that patients with COVID-19 present with cognitive symptoms. As yet, we don't understand what the cognitive symptoms and behavioral sequelae of this is. Hopefully, through research that is already in progress through a collaboration of international neuroscientists, we will, within a year or two, start to understand how COVID affects the brain and help to inform treatment. Research is also important for test development. For example, at the moment, there is a large movement away from pen and paper tests to using electronic testing that may give us more accurate test results. And it also makes it easier to collect normative data because it is easier to pull data. Electronic testing may also not require the same expert skills that pen and paper testing requires, making it possible to screen patients for neurocognitive disorders in low resources settings where there may not be neuropsychologists available to do screening with patients. It is important that there is consistency in how we administer neuropsychological tests across studies, locally and globally. This makes it possible for us to do meta-analysis of data that provides much better scientific information. Where possible, scientists should work together to provide better mental health care for patients based on these principles. So understanding the differences between cognitive constructs and how they interact help us to diagnose patients with specific diseases and also helps us to inform the patient's treatment plan. It helps us to understand how to interact with and rehabilitate the patient and the environment and can determine whether the patient needs surgery, for example, in cases of cancer um, of the brain and epilepsy. Culturally appropriate tests and norms must be used, otherwise our data will be meaningless. Research must be consistent across research sites and must be done with integrity for our work to provide accurate and useful results. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about neuropsychology, I suggest that you go and listen to the Navigating Neuropsychology podcast that you can find at this link. Thank you for listening to this lecture. I hope that you will also listen to some of our other seminars and uh, that you find them useful.